All right. Hey, guys, good morning. How are you doing? Are you good? Are you excited to be in church? Yeah. Two of you. Wow. We're off to a rough start here, guys. Uh, how, about, how about this? Anybody love Jesus in the room today? There we go. Perfect. Well, hey, guys, this is a good friend of mine, Wes. Wes, this is everybody. Everybody, this is Wes. Everybody say hi, Wes. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about what's going on in our county today, guys. And really kind of what, what I wanted to do this morning is I was kind of praying about today is today is all about how do we get mobilized behind what God is doing here in this county. Obviously, this has been a crazy week, right? If you hadn't heard, uh, our county got flooded. Welcome out from underneath the rock that you've been living under. And a lot of people are going through just a, a chaotic moment in time, and uh, as they're losing, they've lost everything. Uh, they're trying to figure out how to coordinate with flood insurance. They don't have flood insurance. Uh, this is a really devastating time for a lot of people. And, uh, and we want to do something about that, right? There's been about uh, 500 people that have been displaced in Whatcom County this last week. Countless homes destroyed uh, or on their way towards actively being unrecoverable. And what I got to say, guys, this last week, if you haven't seen, the church has shown up, ladies and gentlemen. It's been so cool to see, right? Like, like, yeah, you can get excited about that, man. That's awesome. We've got North County Christ the King up in Linden. They became a shelter, immediately started housing families and leveraging hundreds of thousands and thousands of dollars of resources to people in need. Uh, Cornwall's being very generous with their time, their volunteers, their money. Uh, you know, Sunlight and Linden also doing the same kind of housing sort of a situation for people that have been displaced. And uh, we'll talk about Wes here in a second because God put a, a really Really awesome vision for a ministry called Project Restore on his and his family's heart, and uh, we're going to kind of get into that really quick. So you can kind of hear a little bit about what is this whole thing called Project Restore. If you've been seeing our social media accounts, you've uh, seen that we've posted some stuff about that this last uh, week, and we want to get you uh, involved. And so really quick backstory on uh, uh, Wes and his family. We were quarantine buddies yeah. through 2020. That was, that was fun. Yeah, it was. You were there the whole time. We were there pretty okay. much the whole time. They were gracious enough to let us uh, come and stay on their property. I actually got to do some work with Wes. He's, uh, he owns a construction business. And I got to say, guys, uh, framers have a death wish. Like, I don't know if you know that. I remember the first job I was on with Wes. We were doing this, like, two-story barn thing, whatever yeah. it was. And, yeah. and he's up there like a freaking mountain goat jumping all over this thing. And my legs are shaking. But uh, anyways, your, your, your experience, bro, in construction and uh, with some disaster relief where it kind of led yeah. to this whole vision for Project Restore. So why don't you kind of talk to us about that journey of different relief work ministry that you've been a part of and, and how did we get to this uh, this spot of Project Restore being a thing here. Yeah, you bet. Um, so, yeah, just over the years, so, you know, I don't know how many, it's been quite a few years ago. Uh, the first trip I went on was to, uh, I think, Hurricane Sandy hit New Jersey and uh, went there and just was there for about two weeks doing a lot of, you know, same kind of stuff we're doing in Nooksack, uh, Sumas, Everson area. Um, and while you're there, you just, you see these people's homes just get wrecked and you get to just walk right in like Andrew's prayer, you know, walking through the muck and the mire. I'm like, dang, that's exactly like what we're doing and with these people. So anyway, so it's, I mean, it's heavy and it's a lot. And so you kind of go house to house, you pray with these people, they let you in, they tell you their story anyways. So we do that. And then I went to the Philippines, uh, spent two weeks there, same thing, Hurricane Haiyan or Typhoon Haiyan hit. We were there uh, for two weeks as well, and then the, uh, then I was in Texas, uh, and then just coming back, being like, man, there's got to be something without having to travel so far, um, and I know there's so much work to be done here, and, um, but yeah, just praying and praying, and uh, you had a message, me and Aaron left, and we're like, we're like, we got to just tell Taylor, like, he's, it's, it's shouting to us, we got to start, you know, something, and I think it was, uh, what was the... You remember what it was behind Project Restore, the, the scripture? Isaiah 61. Yeah, Say, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Isaiah 61. So anyway, just reading through that, and it just hit, I mean, hard. So we made that first announcement. When was that? Like six, seven months ago? Yeah, sounds about right. And, uh, you know, it was awesome. It kind of it went off, and then we had one. I had one little job to do, and I'm like, you know, like, what's going on? You know, praying and praying, and I'm like, man. And so 
Uh, and then, you know, and something like this happens, and it's like, you know, God, it's so funny how God just will bring you through times and how to, he teaches you how to be patient mm-hmm. and how his timing is everything. Uh, and so this happens, and, you know, and here we are yeah. um, to this point. Um, but, yeah, basically God has just put it so much on not only my heart but Aaron's heart as well and our family um, just about getting, you know, into these people's lives that just get, I mean, turned upside down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so. Yeah, so great. So originally the vision for Project Restore was like, you know, we're going to get into people's houses here in Whatcom County that are run down. They, you know, like some disaster happens or what a hot water heater breaks yep. or yep. roof has a leak and they don't have the finances to actually uh, leverage, you know, uh, uh, fixing it. And mm-hmm. so we were going to get those people's information and then you were going to get out there and fix it. Mm-hmm. And now we've had a, a disaster here in our county. So yep. talk about kind of for us the, how, how the vision of Project Restore is um, translating into this, uh, this current moment that we find ourselves in in a county. But what do you, uh, what's, what's the vision here? You know, you're kind of talking about the three phases, mm-hmm. three phase project. Maybe mm-hmm. you can kind of talk to us through that. Yeah, so basically the f- three phases we're talking about is, you know, for one, we're getting these, we're getting a flood of emails coming in and we're uh, going to these people's homes um, and we're doing flooded, with people with flooded insurance and without. But the main vision is, is we're going to these people's homes that don't have flood insurance. And uh, it's just one of those things where uh, phase one has come in, we're ripping out drywall, ripping out flooring, gutting bathrooms, cabinets. I mean, we're getting that thing going in the crawl spaces, insulation, everything out. Um, Second phase is basically we're drying, getting heat going, get that place dried up. And the third phase is, uh, which I think you have a video of the house I want to do third phase on. But basically, we're going to go back and Go back into these people's homes, uh, drywall, flooring, cabinets, uh, just bring them back, get them back in their home as soon as we can. Yeah. And, you know, I tell, I tell you what, that, there was a couple I told that to um, that we're going to get them back in there. And they, don't, they just had, they just they didn't know what to say. I mean, it was crazy. Come on. And then the flood of emotions that comes over them and, and you as you're talking to them. But other than that, I mean, it's, that's, that's my vision is to come back in. Uh, get these people back in their homes, um, living kind of how they were before they got wrecked again, and you know, yeah, we show them Jesus too during the whole process. Yeah, as well, so. so awesome. Can we actually can we show that video, guys? Danny, you're gonna want to mute the computer here because I think we got some background noise. And then, Wes, maybe you can kind of talk to yeah. us about you know kind of the standard of what you guys are seeing as you're walking into these houses, and uh, yeah. So this one they had about three and a half feet of water in there. Um, yeah, like here we are, you know, the Ritz Ascender crew, uh, ripping up. Shout out, JWR. Uh, no what kidding. Up? <laughs> See what's out there. So uh, that, is, that a, is that like a chalk line you guys yeah. have on the wall? Of yeah, everything they threw me in that bathroom, down? by the way. I had to take care of the bathroom. But yeah, so I go through and I do the drywall and we cut drywall out. Uh, we usually try to find where the water was. So then there we went four foot, half, uh, just to stay up above the water wicking up the drywall and we take it out get the insulation out flooring that whole kitchen was gutted the whole house was basically gutted except for drywall left in the wow four foot up but wow so phase one demo get everything out there yep. phase yep. two get it drying get the dehumidifiers, dehumidifiers in going. there yep. and then phase three we can move into the restoration phase and, and was this and, was and this one of the homes that you wanted to restore this to is the one it? that i want that i would love to restore <laughs> you know when i came because sometimes I'll go early in the morning and I have these addresses that I'll go and look at. And this is one that's kind of, you know, in Nooksack, there are these cul-de-sacs and everybody's going up and down, helping each other out. I see this house and it's all by itself. And I'm like, huh. So I call and they're like, yeah, we don't even know what to do, where to start. And so it's a younger couple and, and they're kind of away from it a little bit. And so no flood insurance. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just super, they're just lost. Like they don't even know where to go. Yeah. Wow. So this is this is one that I, we would love to restore. Yeah, for that's sure. so cool. So I mean, obviously, I, I think I think you guys said something like you've you've actually demoed ten homes between a few we teams that we have. We have in the last what? So the four four days we've been doing it. I yeah, think. that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, what have you guys? How have you seen God at work in the midst of all of this? Oh man, I mean, you know, one of the stories I can't really tell it without probably crying up here but uh other than that i mean this whole thing's a god thing i feel like you know to get us to this point to where we are now 
um, I think every moment is a God moment for sure. You know, yeah. getting people to work together. I mean, shout out to all the people that volunteer, the emailing, the social media, the everything, that everybody that puts time in. I yeah. mean, that's a God moment for sure. Yeah, yeah, so cool. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the vision of this space is, you know, like uh, Stephen Covey talks about this idea in Seven Habits, his book, Seven Habits. And one of the principles is uh, synergy. And it's this idea that we can do far more together than we can by ourselves. And so uh, that's what's so cool about this whole vision that God has released over Wes and his family for Project Restore and for us as a church family to rally around this family and say yes and amen to the vision that God has put on their heart and uh, rally behind it and get as organized as possible, as fast as possible, leverage as many people and resources as we can to get behind this kingdom work that's going on in our community right now. And that's really what it is, right? You know, as you guys yeah. are in, in these homes and, and we've just heard several stories this last week of, I mean, you're going into uh, somebody's like world that's just been completely flipped upside down. Right, and, and, and this is so Jesus, because this is what he does in our lives. This is what he did in my life and yours if you're a follower of Jesus, is he tends to step into that area of brokenness, and that's where he reaches for us. And so uh, we literally have groups of people that are doing that all across our county, and it's been awesome to see and hear the stories of people's hearts opening up and like, you know, cause uh, uh, as you guys are, are praying for people and, you know, uh, take an opportunity to share Jesus with people as God gives the opportunity, people's hearts open up and they're open in a moment like this. And so uh, it's really cool to see um, God uh, at work in the midst of this. So let's talk about some needs, uh, yeah. you know, cause, cause we don't want just information transfer, but let's get involved here. And so can we get the uh, Project Restore Needs slide up here, Andrew? Okay, so uh, number one, one, we need donations for this, guys. We figure, I was talking to Wes, and I was like, hey, man, give us kind of a, a roundabout number as far as what it's going to cost to take one house from, uh, you know, demo all the way through the restoration phase. And uh, we're figuring probably about $30,000-ish, mm -hmm. uh, depending on how large the house is. A couple other variables are obviously going to be at play there. Uh, we have to contract out a couple different subcontractors, right? I think you were yep. talking about HVAC and a couple other things that yep. we probably are going to need to... Uh, sub out. So there's uh, construction costs are obviously high, and uh, this is a really great opportunity for us to really actually get involved in our county and, and uh, show these people the love of Jesus. And so we're looking for uh, donations. And so what we're going to do today, guys, is actually 100% of our offering is gonna go towards Project Restore. So I wanted to have you to have that information before you actually gave today. Of course, if you are like, no, I gotta give my 10 to the church, that's totally fine, we're gonna honor that, but we wanna say, you know what, let's really get behind this this Sunday. We've actually never done anything like this, surprise! <laughs> and uh, uh, just really get behind uh, this ministry here. So everything that we take in, we're gonna give to Project Restore today. We've had a great year financially as a church, and we are really up, and so this is a great opportunity for us to kind of jump to action here. So we'd love for you to consider donating. If you do the text to give option, you can select the drop down menu uh, that says that you give directly to Project Restore. But again, we're gonna just categorize today's offering towards Project Restore as a whole. Uh, I think we've got about $40,000 raised, which is wow. great. I am praying, guys, and believing God. This is my big, crazy, bold prayer request for $2 million. That is a massive ticket right there. Uh, but dude, we've got guys like Kenneth Copeland believing for a private jet, okay? If I wanna believe for $2 million to restore our community, I'm gonna believe for $2 million. So if we've got any business people, you got any business people in your life that are looking for some massive year-end giving, we're gonna run it all through our church's 501c3 so you get the tax write-off. So that would be a great incentive for you to uh, uh, be generous. So I would encourage you to help us get the word out, guys. We do not want money to be our ceiling here. And it, it will be. Money will be our ceiling as far as what we can do. And so uh, God owns a cattle on a thousand hill, and we're believing for just radical provision. Uh, I think 33-ish homes would be about a million dollars to take care of 33 homes from demo all the way through restoration. Uh, demo's cheap, right? It sounds like we're, we've yeah. got some local companies that you can go and dump all this stuff off. Is that yep. right? Yeah. So that's cheap. That's We're just uh, looking for some volunteers and some help with labor. So we'll get to point two here. <clears throat> We're looking for spe a specific type of volunteer. Obviously, we want to take everybody, and our goal is if you're just like, man, I don't even know how to swing a hammer, but like, I want to show up and get involved. We want to find place for you. But specifically, we're looking for volunteers with construction experience 
who can recruit and run their own crew. So this last week, we got some software uh, systems in place to where we're gonna try to be as organized as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, we're gonna get you as the team leader plugged into our software system. And then when we get these inquiries that come in, we can assign you to that house and actually dispatch you out there uh, to go and, and demo the house. So uh, we're looking for guys and gals that know what they're doing, they know their way around the construction industry enough to uh, you know, not make a bad situation worse <laughs> and uh, burn the whole thing to the ground. So we wanna salvage as much as possible. So if that's you, we would love for you to consider, man, hey, can you take a day this next week? Can you take two days? Can you take three days? What does it look like for you? Uh, we would love to leverage you right now and uh, recruit you into this. And uh, Wes is actually gonna be uh, back at the coffee shop after the service. Uh, and uh, we've got a sign up for you. So we just need your name and your email. And uh, we'll get you a Google document that you can fill out a Google form and we'll begin to process you uh, through our systems and, and getting you dispatched to these houses as soon as possible. The third thing that we need is fans and dehumidifiers. So uh, like Wes was talking about, phase one, we get in their demo. Phase two, we wanna dry everything out. And uh, of course, in a moment like this, you know, we saw this during COVID, right? Costco was out of toilet paper like week one. Uh, now we're out of fans So and dehumidifiers. So if you have fans, construction fans and dehumidifiers to give, uh, again, connect with Wes at, at the end of the service. We'll take as many resources as we can get. Also, uh, if you are like, man, I, I, I don't have money, I don't have construction experience, and I don't have fans, but I can cook, I can bring some lunch. We will take you. These guys are working hard. These teams are working hard. Uh, we would love for you to sign up as well. And again, you can give us your uh, contact information and then just put food right next to your name at the end of the service and we'll get you uh, uh, dispatched to some teams as well. And so the idea behind this, guys, as Jesus talks about this in Matthew 25, I just wanted to kind of share this, this scripture. Uh, he says this, for I was hungry, starting in verse 35, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And in fact, if you jump down to verse 40, he says, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've actually done unto me. And so it's this idea that to be a Jesus follower, Jesus actually calls us into the midst of the world around us to meet the felt needs of those that are suffering. And he says, listen, as you're doing that, for those that are down and out, as you're, as you're actually getting your hands dirty in the work that needs to happen, the kingdom work in the midst of your community, you're not actually just, you're, this is, you're, you're doing this as it's unto me. And so God calls us in these moments as the church to not just stand by, but to actually get involved. So I don't know what it is for you, right? It's gonna be different for every single person in this room, but I really want to challenge us collectively as a whole. Man, let's not just virtue signal and throw the give donations to this ministry up on social media, right? Weird flex. Don't do that. And, and then not do anything, all right? If you, you, could, you could do that, but also give money or volunteer. Uh, and so I really want to encourage us in that direction because this is where God is actively involved right now in the midst of our community. So whatever it is for you, we would love for you to consider partnering with us. And, uh, you know, Wes, just want to say so thankful for you, man. So thank thankful for your family and uh, the crews that you guys have already recruited and the work that's going on here. Uh, your heart is pure gold, bro, and uh, I honor you, and I love you. And in fact, we're going to pray for you really quick. So if you guys wouldn't mind, just go ahead and extend a hand out to Wes. We're going to pray for uh, uh, Wes and his team here. God, we just thank you so much for Project Restore and uh, for the work that has already taken place here in our county. God, we thank you that you have already blessed this work. And Lord, we pray that you would uh, just give us the, bring us the finances that we need. Lord, bring us the volunteers that we need. And uh, God, we want to make a, uh, an impact here in our community. And uh, uh, these guys are giving the world around them a very good look at the heart and the face of Jesus. So Lord, we're just uh, praying, God, that you would leverage this moment for your glory uh, as only you can do. Uh, you make beautiful things out of ashes, and uh, you've done it in many of our lives, and you're going to do it for our community around us. And I pray, God, that this would be a rallying moment all across our county, and uh, Lord, we thank you so much for what you are doing. You're actively at work. You are near to the brokenhearted, 
and uh, the broken and the needy. And uh, here we stand as a community, God, in need of your presence and your work among us. And you have called Project Restore as a city set on a hill, <laughs> a light shining in darkness. We pray, God, that you would open up doors for effective ministry. God, that ultimately, our ultimate desire is that people would uh, recognize their need for Jesus in this moment and surrender their lives to you. In Jesus' name, bless Wes, his team, uh, and uh, teams that are going out this week. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Hey, can we give uh, Wes a round of applause, everybody? <laughs> yeah, 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 you can pull out. All right, guys, before we get out of here, oh, thank you, Andrew, my brother-in-law. Love you, dude. Can we give this fine gentleman a round of applause to everybody? Thank you. He's so good looking, ladies, he's taken, sorry about that, but um, okay, guys, I want to I wanna actually stay kind of on this uh, theme here because, you know, uh, we, we want to get behind. This is a very unique moment, obviously, for us as a community, and, and, and it's just crazy how life tends to hit you all at once. Have you noticed that? Like, it, it tends to just hit you all at once, and that's kind of been the scenario for us the last several years, and uh, now we've got, uh, uh, obviously, just uh, chaos happening in our community right now, and so I want to talk some more. The whole idea about today is getting behind what God is doing, and I want to kind of bring you behind the curtain on some different things that God is actually saying right now in the midst of all of this, and in fact, one of our, our elders who uh, is an amazing man, he's been a spiritual father and uh, uh, in my life for the past almost decade, which is amazing uh, to think about. And uh, I've had just the honor and privilege of doing a lot of life with him. And, and, uh, and anyway, so God will speak to him in a very unique way way. Uh, and uh, we've seen that happen this last year. And uh, he received a word from the Lord this last summer that we categorize, we could categorize as a prophecy that I want to talk about here today. Uh, and here's, here's the idea. Let me give you some context on this before we get into this. Uh, God is a speaking God. Right, whether if you believe in the doctrine of the Bible, at least have somewhat of an orthodox view of the Bible, do you believe that God is a speaking God? In fact, Genesis chapter one, right out the gate, God comes out speaking that in his word is creative power. Uh, he is a speaking God. In fact, we, we believe as Christians that the Bible is a co-authored book. That's how you can say about the book of Romans, that the book of Romans was written by Paul, but it was also written by God. So if you're a Christian, you believe and you follow and you love and you serve a speaking God. That is really good news, right? It says in the book of Colossians that by the word of his power, Jesus right now is actually upholding the entire universe. That means that if he stops speaking, everything blows up into a billion pieces, right? That's, that's the reality of, of God as a speaking God. Now, where all of the argument and debate happens is, okay, now uh, in 2021, how does God speak? And essentially, there's two main camps within Christianity about the spiritual gifts of which we could put the ministry of prophet or uh, the gift of prophecy in this category. Uh, there are two main camps. You've got the cessationist camp and the continuationist camp. The cessationist camp would say, you know what? The gifts of the spirit, prophecy, the office of prophet, uh, tongues, miracles, all of that sort of stuff, it ceased with the apostles. You have another category of Jesus follower that would say, no, listen, we believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit have actually continued, that God's heart is that they would be present and active in the world today. And so the question is, are there still prophets? Are people still prophesying? Uh, and let me give you a working definition of prophecy before we move forward here. Prophecy is hearing what Jesus is speaking and speaking it out. Very simple definition. That's what prophecy is all about. Now, regarding uh, the, the office of prophet, a lot of people will say, listen, uh, the prophet was somebody that was only in the context of the Old Testament. And actually, that's not true. Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 28 uh, this is actually really interesting. Spoiler alert, our church is not a cessationist church. We are in the continuationist camp. I really believe, dude, here's what you have to do. You have to take a freaking blowtorch to your Bible to come to any other conclusion than that God's heart is for the gifts of the Spirit to still be present in the church today. So think about this. Acts chapter 11, multiple years after the ascension of Jesus, we have had apostolic leaders in the church already get martyred for their faith, and we come to 
of this character named Agabus, and it says that he stood and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. And in fact, in verse 27, Agabus was, uh, back to verse 27, he was categorized as a prophet. So now we are here in the church age, half, almost halfway through the book of Acts, and we still see non-apostolic leaders in the church. Agabus, crazy name, we haven't ever seen that before, and God has uniquely called him into the office of prophet. He prophesies of a famine that's coming to the land that actually took place. And because of that word, we can go to the next slide here. It says that uh, the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea, and they did so sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So what happened was the church was able to prepare for the famine, and they were able to thrive to it and actually be a benefit to the community. Uh, and, and, and so we, uh, we have seen God use uh, Tim in this way over and over again. And uh, here, let me say this, uh, he is not Jesus, <laughs> right? And Tim will be the first person to tell you that. He's not Jesus. And what we tend to do is people with high level of gifting, we tend to enshrine them. That's always a bad idea. The more you, if you talk about somebody else more than Jesus, that's called idolatry, right? And we're, we're susceptible to that everywhere. We don't wanna do that. But that being said, Tim received a word from the Lord this last July and August. I remember this happening where he said this. The Lord's telling me that 2021, uh, that, that this year is gonna be the year of the 100-year flood. This is back in July and August. And that wherever there was a 100-year flood or record flooding, that God was marking that land for revival and it was gonna be a place where he pours out his spirit. And he said back then ours was gonna take place in November. So here we stand in the midst of a record-breaking flood in November, and I believe that God is marking our land for revival, that he has a heart for Whatcom County. I wanna tell you that Jesus is not giving up on Bellingham, on Whatcom County. There is a lot of work to do. Jesus loves our city. He loves our community, and God is pouring out a spirit, and we're seeing the kingdom advance in our midst. You can get a little bit excited about that if you're awake on me today. <laughs> <clears throat> and so oftentimes what will happen is God will use, and we see this throughout the scriptures, he will use imagery that we understand in the natural realm to speak to us about realities that are happening in the spiritual realm. We see this when Jesus talks about the harvest in Luke chapter 10. Look at this, verse one through two here. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two in every town and place where he himself was about to go. Verse two. Next slide. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, and he sends them out. What Jesus is doing is he's speaking, he's, he's using natural language that we understand, the image of, of a harvest, right? And he's saying, listen, like God is going to, a, he, he's, a lot of people are about to be swept up into the kingdom of God. He's using natural language to explain spiritual realities. We see this also uh, when Jesus, Jesus is on the cross as darkness descended on the land. That is, everything was dark around uh, the, the city in the region where Jesus was crucified, so it was a day of judgment, right? And, and, and incredible mourning and loss and devastation uh, as darkness descended on the land. So what we see is these natural markers that we can see and we understand and we can live into. God will hijack these realities and speak spiritual realities, spiritual truths into them. Now, this is not just an automatic thing. And in fact, we see this in John chapter 10, where Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but he doesn't stop there, right? He doesn't say the harvest is plentiful, period, right? Do you see that? What does he say? Back to verse one, if we can jump back there. Or, uh, sorry, no, verse two. Sorry, you're right. Andrew, you're the best. I'm wrong. You just do you, boo. Uh, you're right. And what does he say? Therefore, the harvest is plentiful, comma, right? It's not a period, meaning there's stuff that has to happen. The harvest is plentiful, comma, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. What he's saying is, listen, God wants to move here. There's a lot of kingdom work to happen, and your part with this, Jesus says right off the bat, is in the ministry of intercession and prayer. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. And then, and then Jesus even takes it a step further, and he says, don't just, don't just pray about it, but I'm actually gonna equip you to do something about it. Go your way. And he actually gives them authority to walk into these cities and regions 
and to uh, actually open up their mouths and share Jesus with the world around them. Uh, so, so this isn't automatic, and this is a part of what uh, uh, Tim was sensing from the Lord. We see this right in the scriptures, right? God wants to move. He partners with his praying church, That Jesus' praying church is the avenue that he uses to accomplish his kingdom purposes for the cities in which that he's placed us. And so, and this is what's happening in, in Luke 10 as well. And so this is something, guys, that is not automatic. And I need you to understand this. God has looked at us as New Song Church and he said, listen, I wanna partner with you. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly. Like this is this idea of the house of prayer, why we talk so much about this. And I wanna, I wanna actually, talked to you about a community uh, back in 1949 off of, uh, of Scotland in the Hebrides Islands. There was a community of people that experienced an outpouring of God's spirit and a regional move of God that was incredible. And you can actually go find their interviews. A lot of them are still alive uh, today and talk about this. And it's just fascinating to hear about uh, what happened here in uh, the Hebrides Islands. There was these two old women. Uh, they were 84 and 82. One's name was Peggy. The other was Christine. Peggy was actually blind. And uh, Christine was doubled over with arthritis, had horrible arthritis, which shows that, uh, you know, I, I love that. These women in their 80s, God used to do an incredible thing, which means, listen, you are never too old to be used by God to do incredible things. And you are never too young to be used by God to do incredible things. And so these, these ladies, they couldn't leave their house and get to the church gathering, but what they could do is they could pray. And so they entered into a season of praying and crying out to God and, and Jesus, we need you to move on our city, our region. Would you pour out your spirit? Would you do an amazing thing? And they were constantly crying out to God, uh, saying, you know, the harvest is plentiful. Lord, would you pour out revival? Would you send forth laborers? Would you come and work in the midst of our land? And in fact, one of the uh, uh, key verses for them was Isaiah chapter 44, verse three. And it says this, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. I I need you to say, I want that. You want that. I want that for my kids. I want that for our church. I want that for our county. I want that for our city. And so they're crying out to God. God, would you pour out the water of your spirit? And what's interesting in the Bible, you see often the language of the Holy Spirit is used uh, symbolically with the language of the flood and of water. So they're crying out, God, pour out your spirit. And at the same time, there was actually a group of seven young men who covenanted together to get together three days a week and cry out for revival in a barn. So they gather three days a week for several months. They're crying out to God, Jesus, would you do it? Would you save lost people? Would you move in our region? Do something awesome. And here's the thing. You might be thinking at this point, uh, revival, what is that? I don't get it. I think everything's fine. Leonard Ravenhill says this. He says, revival is when God gets so sick and tired of being misrepresented that he shows himself. I love that. That's what revival is, guys. And so uh, if, you, if you look at the church, right, let's start here. Do you see sin? Do you see compromise? Do you see lukewarmness? Do you see lack of love and wholehearted devotion to Jesus? If not, here's the thing. That means that those realities are present in your life and you actually need revival, right? That's the point. And none of these things are, 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 none of those realities are present in heaven right now, I promise you. Lack of love, lack of devotion, uh, that, you know, none of those realities are present in heaven. Lukewarmness, right? Everybody that's around Jesus right now is having a really good day. Did you know that? They're having a really good day. In fact, we, we kind of see what, what they're experiencing right now in the book of Revelation where Jesus is like, yo, you got elders, you got living creatures, you've got all these people falling on their faces. They can't lift their face off the pavement because the glory of God is weighing them down, right? You've got these elders that are on these thrones surrounding Jesus and they're chucking their crowns at Jesus' feet, falling at his face and they never stop saying, worthy is the lamb, worthy is Jesus. What the image of the crown guys. It's the image of all of your accomplishments, everything that you've built your life on. It's the image of your kingdom. And what they're doing is they're throwing it at Jesus's feet and saying, I have found something so much more beautiful than any of that. Just give me Jesus. You can have everything else. They're not bored. They're having a really good day right now because they are close to Jesus. Revival is when that heart posture 
comes and invades the church now and we move into a moment of radical devotion and love for God, passion for vision, holiness re-enters the church. It's a moment when heaven invades the earth and that's what we need right now. And so uh, there's a moment in John chapter 12 where in fact we see Mary, uh, a, a dear friend of Jesus in his ministry, and she brings this pound of ointment. And uh, Jesus is about to be betrayed and murdered and crucified and buried for the sins of humanity. And Mary comes and she dumps this ointment all out on Jesus's feet. Now we, we kind of think like, what's up with that? That doesn't make any sense. The ointment for her was basically her financial security. Right? It was, it, was, it was about the equivalent of a year's wages, all right? And so for, for her as a woman in that day to have something like that and pour it out like that was just, it was completely unheard of. And she, here she's, she's, she's not just pouring oil, she's dumping her entire life at the feet of Jesus. And she's like, Lord, you can have everything, right? She is pouring out all of her love. And here's the thing, when we see love like that, we tend to do the same thing that the Pharisees did. And we say, What's wrong with this chick, you know? She's crazy, like, what is this? But Jesus, he said, no, no, no. Like, listen, everywhere the gospel is preached, it's gonna be shared in remembrance of her. That what Mary did for Jesus so moved his heart that everywhere the gospel goes under the return of Jesus, her story is gonna be told because it's so ministered to and blessed his heart. Jesus, in fact, from the cross, he would have smelled the ointment that Mary poured out on his feet. That, guys, is the image of revival. When we move beyond the realm of playing church and we actually become the church of Jesus, when we move beyond the realm of religiosity into the realm of the heart, when we move beyond the realm of try hard do-goodism into the realm of my whole life is given to Jesus because I see him and I know him and I love him and he's wrecked me forever. That is the picture of revival. And so these guys are crying out for it and uh, they're seeking God. God, would you move in our city? <laughs> and month after month, they're just seeking God and uh, uh, they're being the persistent widow. And in fact, this is how Jesus teaches us to pray. We see this in Luke chapter 18, verse one through eight. Look at this, is awesome. Let me give you some stuff on prayer here. Jesus is teaching his disciples on prayer and uh, he, he says this, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. I love that because what does that mean? That means as we go to pray, what are we gonna wanna do? Give up and lose heart, right? If you've ever tried to like pray consistently over something, you've experienced that. And so Jesus is like, okay, I recognize this is gonna happen. Let me tell you a story so that you'll always pray and not lose heart. He's getting after the fervency uh, and the direction of prayer right here. And he says, he said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Let's keep going through the first eight verses. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but after he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. He's annoyed, he's bored, go away, and I'll give you what you want so you leave me alone. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Next verse. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So God is not like the unrighteous, unjust judge. God is the God of justice who loves to hear the faithful cry, the persistent prayer of his people. And he promises, I will respond to these type of praying people. And in fact, what's really interesting, Jesus correlates faith with persistent prayer. Right? He's like, when I come back, because Jesus will one day bodily descend to the earth and establish his kingdom rule and reign in the midst of the nations and renew everything, it's gonna be awesome. We want you in on it. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, he's the only way. I'll give you an opportunity to do that in a couple minutes. But he says, listen, when I come back, am I gonna find faith on the earth? What's the marker of faith? It's the prayer room, guys. Right, do you see that? Like it's the marker of faith is, is there a group of people that are actually coming together and crying out incessantly, persistently to the God of justice to pour out his spirit and to work in the midst of the world around us. And this is the kind of faith that uh, God answers. Stubborn, persistent faith. It's like my son, you know, I remember when I was a kid, my mom used to pray, Taylor, 
you know, I, you know, I'm praying that God gives you a kid that's as much of a disaster as you were for me, right? Moms, which by the way, such a horrible thing to pray. I got two, okay? I got two. And seriously, I have to talk to my kids. Like, and I don't know if it's more for them or for me, but every once in a while, it's like, hey, hey, little human, I'm the boss. Like, you're not the boss. Stop being so stubborn. And so I will win, you will lose, so you might as well give up now, right? And so eventually they do, and, and uh, I win, and that's because I'm dad. And so, you know, like, that's, that's the point. It's that stubborn, strong-willed, incessant, persistent prayer that gets the answer. What we tend to do is we pray these little popcorn microwave prayers as Christians, right? We just pop our little prayer request in, and, you know, hey, Jesus, give me the date with the hot chick I met and on, you know, uh, whatever the stupid dating apps are that people are using. I don't know. You know, give me, the, I'd love to go on a date with her. Give it to me. Uh, give me the good spot at Costco. Give me the raise. Give me the money. All right, peace out. I'm on with my life. We tend to only pray these microwave prayers and, and no wonder that we don't see God answer, right? And here's the reason why you don't see answered prayer. If this is you in your life, you wanna know why? One of the reasons why? You give up too soon. You give up way too early. What Jesus is going after here, he's like, listen, sometimes you have to knock and keep on knocking. You have to ask and keep on asking. Listen, just because you've been praying something for a few days, weeks, months, years, doesn't mean that you haven't tapped into God's heart and it's not something that you want to do. Keep crying out out, right? Keep seeking God for what you're believing him for. And in fact, there's a moment in Mark chapter eight, I believe, when Jesus, he casts a demon out of a guy and the disciples are like, why couldn't we do it? And what does he say? It, this kind goes out only by prayer and by fasting. A lifestyle of consistent, persistent prayer and seeking God is a life of power. And these guys on Hebrides, they modeled that for us. In fact, here's what's interesting. You know, the name Israel actually means he who contends with God. <clears throat> that God is looking for a people who are willing to actually wrestle with him and believe that he is good and that he'll do what he says he's gonna do and hold on to that until they see that invade the reality of the world around them and their circumstances. And so one of, the night, one of these nights, these seven guys, they're seeking God in one of these prayer meetings and uh, they wrote about their experience that night and it says this, uh, they wrote this, they said, an awesome awareness of, God's, uh, uh, of God overcame us and we were all of a sudden drenched with supernatural power we ha had not yet known before. And so Peggy, one of, our, uh, one of the sisters, she actually, the blind one, ironically enough, God gives her a vision where she sees the churches all across her city filled with hundreds of people who are giving their lives to Jesus in repentance. And they, they contacted the pastor and they were like, hey, get ready, uh, heaven's breaking through, heaven's invading the earth, and that's exactly what happened. And uh, Duncan Campbell, who was kind of the spearhead of the uh, preaching aspect of this revival, he says this, when God stepped down, suddenly men and women all across the parish were gripped with the fear of God. I love that. And in fact, one of these, uh, he's, he's super Scottish. So like whenever Scottish dudes talk or pray, it's like super epic. So you can find it on YouTube. You should go check it out. It's awesome. But you know, when, when uh, in, in one of these services, this is how you know this move of God was legit. There was a high school dance that was happening where all of the high school kids, they got convicted and they ran to the altar and, and were like repenting, right? So think about that, guys. What has to happen in the context of your high schooler's life to get them to leave the dance Dance and rush the altar at church and surrender their entire lives to Jesus. But that's what was going on. And the point is here, the big point in this moment that we find ourselves in is prayer precedes revival every single time, right? We see that in the book of Acts, Acts chapter two. They're constantly giving themselves to prayer. Acts chapter one, verse 14. They were a people devoted to prayer, right? You've got the, the 120 up in the upper room. They're crying out, God, pour out your spirit. Do an amazing thing. Fast forward to Acts chapter two, one through four. God pours out his spirit and an entire city hears the good news of Jesus and thousands of people are added to the kingdom. And guys, I just wanna say today, can we believe for God to do it again? Can we believe that what he did in Acts chapter two, what he did in 1949 and the Hebrides revival, can we actually be a people of faith that would dare to believe that God sees our city and our county? He loves people here and he wants to move and can we respond in faith and fill the prayer room and cry out to God until he answers from heaven 
Because church history shows, church history shows it doesn't take many, right? We've got a blind <laughs> and, and arth- arthritic woman, you know, who's bent over. They can't leave their house. Two women cried out to God and an entire city was transformed. And so that's what we want to do. Uh, <clears throat> we are in one of those moments where God is actually inviting us as a church to be the persistent widow. And he's saying, I will move Again, now this is why our monthly watches, why what we're doing, guys, these 24-hour periods of worship and prayer are so critical, why our weekly prayer meetings are so critical. Uh, And here's the thing, you know, I know, I wanna just encourage you, if you have been a part of one of these prayer times, this is not a time to take the foot off the gas pedal, but to put the foot all the way down to the floor on the gas pedal. I wanna encourage you to double up, triple up on your commitment to these prayer times that you're a part of. Uh, Commit to one if you're not a part of one Thursday night from Seven to eight is our all church prayer meeting. I would love to have you come and join us uh, for that one. I'm here every week on Thursdays with Dane and Amy. It's awesome. We would love uh, to have you. And here's the amazing thing, guys. I was thinking about this because Jesus, he's, he's, he's not making this stuff up, right? He's, he's really not. Like he really does move when we pray. And this is what we have to wake up to. And in fact, we've seen this every time we do one of these 24 hour periods of worship and prayer, God marks that next Sunday in a supernatural way. We've seen this every time. And in fact, we had... Uh, Uh, This last weekend, after our watch, we get this, okay? You listening? Okay, pay attention. We had our highest attended weekend service out of our church's history on a non-holiday, right? Literally, in our church's history, more people in our building and watching online. We had over 400 people in our building between two services and another 100 plus online. We've never had that happen before as a church. And what does Jesus say? He says, listen, as the Son of Man is lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. That means as we lift up the name of Jesus, I'm speaking to the church now, as we lift up the name of Jesus in our worship and in our intercession, Jesus is actively drawing lost people to himself. We're gonna see the lost saved. We're gonna see a city transformed as we continue to press in here. Dude, I am not giving up. I am sold out for revival. The reason why I'm here on this stage, why I am the lead pastor of this church is because I believe that we are on the cusp of the next move of God and that God wants to use you to bring it about and us together to bring it about. And and we get to uh, partner with him in a unique way as we become a house of prayer. So let me give you some prayer points this week. Let's get practical. Uh, I want you to take a screenshot of this and uh, just bring this into uh, you know, your morning devotional, bring it into the prayer teams that you're a part of here at our church. Number one, what do we wanna pray? We wanna pray that God would pour out his spirit on the spiritually dry ground of Whatcom County, Isaiah 44, verse three. Let's stand on that promise. God, would you pour out your spirit in our city and our county? Would you transform our region as you invade Whatcom County with your presence? Number two, let's pray consistently for Project Restore that God would provide all the finances and volunteers that we need and open doors for effective ministry that we would actually see not only people's physical needs get met, but their spiritual needs get met, we would see people surrender their lives through to Jesus uh, through the work of these amazing volunteers that are going out in the midst of our community. And let's pray for revival in the church and awakening in the city, that God would transform our, our hearts, our own hearts, personally and individually. He would move on our church and the churches of the world around us and uh, our, our city. Uh, so take a picture of that. Again, would love for you to be contending for that in the place of prayer this week. We've got work to do, ladies and gentlemen, amen? Amen. All right, hey, would you stand with me? I wanna pray us out here in just a second. And and before I do that, let me just, uh, uh, one more thought here. You might be here or watching online, if that's you, stoked that you are watching with us online, Uh, but maybe you're not a Christian. And uh, you're just kind of sitting here like, man, what the, what the heck? These people are crazy, like giving, leveraging tens of thousands of dollars and volunteer hours and, and, and like this is crazy. What would provoke a people to actually do something like that? Let me tell you what would provoke a people to do something like that. It says this in Ephesians chapter five, verse one. Here's where I was at this morning uh, before I came here. This is what it says. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in Love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. 
Friend, if you're not a follower of Jesus, I wanna tell you that Jesus loves you. Uh, he cares for you. He lived a perfect life, the perfect life that you could never live. He died the death that you deserve because of your sin. So now in him, you can have forgiveness of sin. He'll beat death for you and give you eternal life. And uh, nobody's ever loved you like this. I wanna give you an opportunity today to surrender your life to Jesus. So if that's you, we got a prayer team up here. We would love to pray with you and get you introduced. And maybe you're here and you're like, man, I wanna give. I want want to volunteer, I want to get involved again. Wes is going to be in the back, and bro, maybe you can head back there and get ready, uh, and uh, we're going to get some people signed up here. So let's pray together, guys. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for letting us in on what you're doing, <clears throat> and for the honor of being a part of your work here in our county. Father, we thank you so much for uh, uh, just uh, Project Restore and the team and Lord, all of the incredible work that's happening uh, in our county through these different ministries and churches. And uh, Lord, we pray that all, the world around us would get a really good look at your face in this moment as we rush in to meet the needs of the broken and the needy. Father, I pray if there's anybody in this room that needs to do business with God and surrender their lives to you, God, that you give them grace to repent today of sin and surrender their lives to you as King and Lord uh, and uh, experience new life in you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, guys, love you. You're amazing. So glad that you're here. Have a great day. If we can pray for you, please come forward. Otherwise, have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.